الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين دي برادر سيسترز إن إسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Before we receive your phone calls, I do apologize for the seven delays, uh, seven minutes delay. It's my mistake. I was late driving and I had to pray عصر before we come on air. Uh, the first question is from Diana Manal. She says, if a woman is on her menses and she is not fasting, is it okay to eat in public if she lives in a non-Muslim country? Uh, scholar, some scholars say that it is best that she refrain from eating and drinking in public so that people would not think uh, negative uh, of her. But as she is living in a non-Muslim country, it is permissible for her to eat and drink as this is not something uh, mandatory for her to abstain from eating or drinking. Uh, Zuleikha uh, or Zulhi says that I wanted to know if we can brush our teeth when we are fasting. If not, then can we use a mouthwash? Both are permissible while uh, fasting with the condition that you are sure that nothing goes into your throat, nothing goes into your stomach. So if you can make sure of that, then this is totally permissible. Mubashir says, Assalamu alaikum, can you please tell me that can we ask for forgiveness from Allah if we break our fast by doing a sin instead of fasting 60 days or feeding 60 poor people? A lot of the Muslims are confused about the things that mandate and obligate a kafara, a fidya, when breaking a fast. Everything you do that breaks your fast is a sin but it does not require a fidya, with the exception of sexual intercourse during the day of Ramadan while in the state of fasting. So whoever does this, he is obliged to free a slave, if not possible, then to fast 60 consecutive, uh, two months, two consecutive months. If not, then to feed 60 poor people for every day that he has uh, uh, missed. Now, if someone ejaculates, he does not have intercourse, he's not punished by this fidya or this expiation. If someone eats deliberately, he's not punished. It's a sin, but the punishment, this uh, major expiation, is only for those who have sexual intercourse uh, during the month of Ramadan. And seeking Allah's forgiveness is due, and it's obligatory throughout the whole uh, 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 things that nullify and void your fasting, but not in that, uh, uh, okay, okay, brother Tariq from the Emirates, from Emirates, yes, brother Tariq, Assalamualaikum, yes, sir. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam, Akhi. How are you? Alhamdulillah, uh, Sheikh. I have two questions. Okay. My question number one is about one of the uh, while well, you were answering a question yesterday mm -hmm. about the exchange of gold from old gold with the new gold and it is riba. Actually, I was discussing this subject with my one of my friends. And as this is a very common practice here. So if you, I, I request you, if you can please uh, give a little more uh, detail about this. Okay. And I have one more question. And my second question is about taking loan for car or for home, you know, from Islamic bank like Sharia Islamic Bank and other Islamic bank in UAE. Okay. Is, this, is this halal or haram or uh, what's your recommendation? Okay, I will answer your questions, inshallah. Okay, uh, Brother Tariq had two questions. The first question is exchanging the gold. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu salam, in reference to six uh, materials, gold, silver, dates, barley, um, uh, grain, and salt. These six materials, the Prophet, alayhi salam, said that when exchanging, they have to be identical. So the same weight, the same measurement, the same type, in, and it has to be hand by hand. We cannot give uh, uh, each other, I cannot buy, for example, gold in installments. This is totally riba. I have to 
pay a thousand euros and get the grams agreed simultaneously on the same spot, give and take. So when it comes to gold, if you have, if I have old gold and I go to the gold shop and I give him a hundred grams worth of old gold, so it's a bracelet, for example, of my wife, and he says, I'll give you this much in it. But I see something new that I want to, be, uh, to buy. So he says, okay, I'll take the old gold and I'll give you the new gold. You have to pay me X, Y, Z extra. This is totally prohibited because the exchange is not equal. So the only way to legitimize it is to sell my gold, 100 grams. Okay, take it. Give me the money. I cash in the money. Now this is a separate transaction. If I wish, I could leave. If I wish, I could buy something else. If I were to buy something else, then how much is this? It's so-and-so, no, give me a discount. Yes, okay, we bargain. He gives me a, a final price, take the money, and I add some more money to that, and this is a new, separate, independent uh, transaction. As for buying from an Islamic bank, unfortunately, everything now has the title uh, um, Islamic to it. So you find an Islamic restaurant, an Islamic TV channel like ours, but ours, alhamdulillah, is genuine. You find um, Islamic nasheed. Then you have Islamic dancing. Then tomorrow maybe Islamic belly dancing. I don't know. So just attaching the word Islamic to it doesn't make it Islamic. And in, in Saudi, unfortunately, we have something they call Islamic uh, 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 champagne or Saudi champagne and they re refer to a juice but because it's uh, it has bubbles in it and fi it's fizzy then they th call it Islamic so you have to know exactly what is meant by Islamic and I cannot give a general answer to whether this transaction is right or not, not before I study it so before going into borrowing the actual borrowing is not found in Islamic banks they don't lend you money. Nowhere you would go to an Islamic bank and he gives you a loan. They would have a transaction. They will give you something for sale. So they will sell you probably uh, a car. They will sell you stocks. They will sell you uh, air conditioners. And you buy them from them in installments. And later on, when you take the merchandise, you sell it somewhere else for cash. And this is what people usually refer to as uh, a loan. And I... And I have to look into it so that I can uh, uh, judge whether it's halal or haram. Uh, Idris from Saudi. Hello. Yes, Idris. Yeah, and my question is. You can ask my question. Yes, but listen to me from the phone and not from the TV. And I, I say this to all the people who are viewing this and calling in. Before you uh, pick up the phone, mute your TV and listen to us from your phone, please. Yes, go ahead. Okay, my question is that, uh, please, uh, please, I have uh, many people say that using toothpaste while fasting is haram, some say it's makru, some say it's okay. So I would like to know from the sheikh, is it allowed to use the toothpaste while fasting? Okay. Any more questions? No, thank you. You're welcome, Akhi. Okay. Maimuna from Said Saudi. Maimuna. Maimuna from Saudi Arabia. Yes. I'm waiting for your call, for your question. Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can Hello? hear you. I can hear you. Yes. Um, my question is, if um, you are fight with somebody and that violates your uh, fasting, do I have to pay that day back? How, so how did you, how, what did you do? You fought with them, you cursed them, you said bad things? I have a hard time hearing you, sir. I cannot hear you. I, I can't hear you either. I will answer your question, inshallah, I, if it's the question. Okay. Um, Idris from Saudi Arabia was asking about the toothpaste. And he says people say that it uh, uh, nullifies your, your fasting. And Maimuna was, if I understood her correctly, because there was so much air and uh, interference with her call, she says that she violated her fasting with someone, I think, through a fight, and she said verbal bad words. So does this void her fasting? The things that void your fasting, scholars say, are seven. So memorize them 
and then you don't have to worry about anything else because now you know that these seven nullifies your fasting, nullify your fasting, so anything else does not. First of all, eating and drinking. So eating and drinking, anything that goes into your stomach, into your uh, stomach, through the mouth or through the nose, then this nullifies your fasting. Even if you swallow a stone, it nullifies your fasting. Secondly, whatever takes the role of food and drink, such as the IV, if you have gelicos, for example, that you can live for three, four days without eating and drinking just because of this uh, IV is going into your veins. So this nullifies your fasting. And this means that if I take antibiotics, if I take uh, uh, Voltarine shots, if I take insulin, if I take penicillin, anything that does not nourish me, that does not take the role of eating and drinking, this doesn't nullify your fasting. So if someone says, if uh, uh, I have to take vaccines, does it affect my fasting? No, it doesn't. I have to uh, extract a tooth and the doctor gives me uh, what they call uh, tranquilizers or whatever, uh, uh, or anesthesia. Does it an affect my fasting? The answer is no. Thirdly, vomiting intentionally. I ate too much. I have something going on. I don't like it. I put my finger or smell something and I vomit intentionally, this voids my fasting. If I ate too much and I feel disturbed and all of a sudden without me helping it, I'm throwing up, I'm vomiting, this is unintentional, it doesn't affect your fasting. Fourthly, cupping, and this is an issue of dispute among scholars. So the most authentic opinion, it's safer not to cup while fasting. Cupping is having scratches and uh, slashes on the back of your uh, neck or on your shoulders and then extracting the rotten blood and it's a, he a, a form of healing and medication and it's good the prophet uh, uh, encouraged it but during fasting refrain from it because it's an issue of, issue of dispute however uh, uh, taking samples of your blood for the hospital is totally permissible bleeding from your gum while the doctor the dentist is working this is does not affect your fasting try not to swallow it <coughs> what else uh, donating blood, if it wears you down and it's a, a, a pint or two, if in this case, make it after Maghrib. And if you don't have uh, the possibility to make it after Maghrib, then do it and make up for that day. Fifthly, ejaculation. Any person ejaculating, while well, he's awake of course, because this is different than nocturnal emission. What you suffer or what you have of uh, wet, th what they call wet dreams when, when you ejaculate while sleeping this doesn't affect your uh, fasting at all but if you do it intentionally while awake by seeing at, looking at something or thinking or masturbating this nullifies your fasting sixth is intercourse and this is the highest of all and we spoke about the expiation in the beginning seventh is the blood of menses or postnatal bleeding these Two, if there exists, then the fast is void, even if it's seconds before the Adhan of the Maghrib. Now, if you look at toothpaste and look at these seven categories, you will find that as long as it doesn't go into your throat, you're in the clear. And for Sister Maimuna, again, verbally abusing people and, and doing wrong things or fighting, it's not part of the seven. So it reduces the reward, but the fast is Correct. Who do we have? Uh, Farah from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, I have a question. Is yeah. it allowed in Islam to ask Allah for anything by using the name of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a wasila? Okay. Any question? Any other question? No more. Okay. Thank you, Sheikh. Azam from Saudi Arabia. Yes, hello. Yes, Azam. Yes, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, uh, today I have a question uh, from you. Basically, there is a, uh, I, I'm watching one of my local country TV channel and there is a debate going on between uh, a, Shi uh, a Shia scholar and uh, a, a scholar from El Sunnah. And the debate was on the topic of uh, temporary nikah. That is, that Shia scholar is calling or labeling it as muta'a. And what he's uh, he's quoting Quran, uh, uh, one Quranic ayah as well plus ahadith and and there is an even in the life of uh, Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and during the time of Bazwai Tabuk, 
that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed this temple to be Mecca. But as per Ahl Sunnah Alim, he is called as he told uh, that it was a timely, a temporary uh, kind of uh, judgment by a Prophet, and later during the time of Pamir al Mumini, as it over, it was finished. And uh, it is no, no, no longer valid. But they then bring up a debate from some other Ahl Sunnah scholars that it is still allowed, but don't, we cannot misuse it and it's still okay. stuff like this. I get you, Tom. Uh, the thing is that the Ellison uh, uh, scholar was not uh, able to confidently defend our 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 uh, motive or our our uh, stand on the, this uh, topic of Mota. So can we have a solid or consolidated answer? That this is all, my brother. Just to okay. just to uh, remove the confusion for our brothers and sisters. I will try my level. Allah bless you. Allah bless you. Kamil from Saudi. Um Kamil from Saudi. 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 Yes. Salam to Allah. Uh, so I heard you say yesterday that zakat money cannot be used to feed the poor. Uh, is there a different opinion in situations of war like in Syria? Currently there are many pension organizations like Muslim Hand and Islamic Relief and Hand in Hand for Syria who are collecting zakat money so that they can use it to feed the hungry Syrians. Okay. Uh, to buy the missile packages and things like that. Is this okay or... Uh, because this is the only way to reach out to the Syrians who have no food, uh, who have no money to buy food, and obviously food is the topmost priority in the refugee camps I will and ask for the you. poor Syrians living in, uh, still in Syria. So if we cannot help them with the zakat money, uh, this gets us into a very difficult um, I will ask you situation. Please uh, elaborate, and thank you so much. You're welcome, uh, Kamal. Uh, uh, Medina, uh, Amina from Saudi. Hello, salam alaikum, Chef. Salam wa rahmatullah. Yeah. I'm very happy today for getting online. Exactly. This is my first time. I have been trying several times. I want to ask a question. My daughter, she has her menstruation during this Ramadan. Okay. No, she has her menstruation for four or five days. So she completed already. She washed already. She fasted one day. Then the next day again, she has to I want to know if her uh, fasting is valid or she has to make up for that day. She had spotting or she had the blood flowing? She finished the menstruation, okay? Again? She was already, she made go full. No, and no, then after. She started again the fasting. Okay. She fasted for one day, there was no spotting, nothing happened. Then the next day, the following day, again she had some spotting. It was not flowing, only like drops okay. of skin. So I want to know if this nullifies her fasting or she has to make up for uh, this days. I will answer you, inshallah. Okay. Who? Who? Escape from Saudi? Escape from Saudi? Listen to me from the phone, please. Hello? Yes. Yeah, hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, I want to ask a question. Yeah, I want to ask a question, Sheikh. Uh, I want to know that if Ziyara, being Ziyara is allowed. Ziyara to what? Because people say it's like a form of grave worshipping. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Ashfaq from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, doing Umrah and Ramadan, you get a reward as uh, doing Umrah with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, now if you're doing it for somebody else, do you get the same reward or is it worse? If, if what? If you do the Umrah for somebody else and yes. for the new person, will they get the same reward as we get it? Okay. When we do it. Okay. Any more questions? Wajazak. Hayakallah. Okay, we have a number of questions and we begin uh, seeking Allah's guidance. Farah from Saudi Arabia and all the callers are from Saudi Arabia. She says, can we ask Allah Azza wa Jal and pray to Allah Azza wa Jal through the wasila, through our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and the answer is no. This is an innovation. It is not shirk to ask Allah Azza wa Jal that, oh Allah, with uh, the right of the Prophet to you alayhi salatu wasalam, or with the right of Angel Jibreel to you, I ask you this and that. This is a, an innovation, a bid'ah. And it's not uh, shirk, but it is not something that is recommended. You ask Allah Azza wa Jal through three things. One, his beautiful names and attributes. Two, through your own good deeds and actions. I fed a blind woman uh, who was hungry and stranded. 
And then later on, I want to ask Allah, Oh Allah, because I did feed that woman for your sake, Oh Allah, do this and that for me. So this is permissible. Thirdly, by asking the living, righteous people to pray for you. So someone is righteous and I go to him, I say, Shaykh, uh, I have a problem with um, uh, my debts. So pray to Allah that Allah relieves me from these debts. And the man raises his hands and supplicates for me. This is permissible. Any form other than that is not permissible and it's an innovation or it can reach to shirk. Azam saying that he saw a debate between a Sunni and a Shi'i. And I yani, definitely ask the brothers and sisters not to engage in such debates because at the end of the day, a hundred points the good guys happen to refute 99%. 1% remains in your heart and this may corrupt your heart. So why watch such uh, uh, debates? Aren't you in confidence of your religion? Then remain studying your religion rather than watching people insulting your religion and waiting for someone to defend that. However, he says that the issue of um, uh, 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 nikah, of mut'a, mut'a, marriage, which is... In, in a nutshell, it was permitted in the beginning of Islam because the Muslims were in need for that and they did not have financial means and it was a win-win situation. The Prophet permitted it, والسلام, I meet a girl, I like her, and I say, listen, I'd marry you for one week for 500 euros. And then after the week is over, everything is over. I don't have to give you any uh, allowance. Uh, you're divorced by default and, and that is it. At the beginning, it was permissible and you have to look in the, uh, um, the environment, the situation. At that time, everything was permissible. All the idol worshippers and the Arabs, there was adultery, there were uh, prostitution, uh, uh, legitimized and brothels and etc. So this was, a, in a sense, a way of diverting from these haram things into something that is between halal and haram. And it was permitted by the Prophet ﷺ. Later on, the Prophet banned it, and that was on the seventh year of Hijrah. Putting Umar's name in it, may Allah be pleased with him, is one of the deviant ways of Shia. Umar had nothing to do with it. At the consensus of all the companions after the death of the Prophet, that it was permissible. Uh, that is, it was prohibited, except for Ibn Abbas. At the beginning, he used to permit it, because he did not hear or learn that the Prophet has forbidden it, alayhi salam. But later on, he went back on his fatwa and he went with the consensus and all the companions agreed on making it haram. And now this still remains. Taking the Shia's opinion into consideration is worthless because they don't believe in our Quran. They don't believe, well, the majority of them do believe in our Quran because they don't read their books. If they go a little bit to the level of student of knowledge and open Al-Kafi by the Kilini and this is the most authentic uh, book to them. And they will find that it states that all of their imams say that the Quran you have is not what Allah revealed. So you're me telling me that the, the only copy of the only book that is authentic and unaltered, unchanged for 15 centuries is not authentic. This is blasphemous. So we do not look at what they say because they are a small minority that sings out of the crowd and they do not have anything in common with us not even the books of sunnah they don't reject all our books of sunnah they slander all of our companions except six or seven like ammar ibn yasir and hudayf ibn yaman and, and others only those they accept and salman farsi of course but abu hurairah abu bakr umar uthman all the righteous uh, companions of the prophet والسلام, they all disregard them and discredit them and some of them even go to the further and say that they are disbelievers. So, Akhi, yani, don't watch these uh, uh, debates. It only hardens your heart. It throws doubts in your mind. You have the Quran, you have the Sunnah. Let everything else go. But to come and look, yeah, they said this, yeah, Akhi, 1400 years ago, the companions agreed upon it. Now you're going to reinvent the wheel? And they say that the Quran says so and so. You don't believe in the Quran that we say. And you bring me and you quote me an ayah. You don't know Arabic. And you say, no, it means so and so. It doesn't mean so and so. Where did you get this? Oh, our imam, 12 imams. The 12th one is in a cave. He went in a cave like uh, uh, 1300 years ago. And he's still waiting until Allah tells him to come out. 
He was a child when he went in. And he has a river of milk and a river of honey. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And yes, only the, the ayatullahs, the mullahs, know and communicate with him. They have like, I think, SMS or BB, and they're just chit-chatting. What, what kind of religion is this? Akhi, we have the Quran, we have the Sunnah. Don't go into this nonsense, with all due respect. Uh, um Kamil says that yesterday I spoke about the ayah, verse 60, chapter 9. Allah says in four of the categories, This is to give it to them in cash. When he mentioned the other four, he said, He mentioned that this is to be given to them. This is to be given, but indirectly. So if someone has a loan, and the authorities is going to put him in jail. I don't have to give it to him, and then he pays the debtors. No, I can go straight to the debtors and give it to them. This is clear, inshallah, and it's permissible. When it comes to the poor and the needy, I have to give it to them in cash, and they do whatever they want to do. By me giving it to Rav, for example, or for uh, charity organizations, and I authorize them to give it to the poor and to the needy, they will do the same thing. They will go to the um, uh, Syrian refugee camps and see what they have and tell them, listen, we have charity and we have zakat. And we would like to bring you something. What would you like to have? Food or clothes or uh, medication? And they would select. So they would authorize them to buy them these things. This becomes permissible. But for me to go directly and give rice to the poor as zakat, this is not the right way of doing it. Amina says that her daughter... Uh, menses is five or six days. She saw her purity and she's sure that it's the end of it. She had a ghusl. She fasted for a whole day. And after a day, she saw spotting. Spotting does not affect your fasting. Menses is the flow of blood. As long as you saw for a whole 24 hours that you are pure and you saw the sign of your purity. Because women either see their sign of purity through seeing the white thread-like discharge... So nothing comes with it, and it's a, a, a white thread-like discharge. Or they know their purity by total dryness for a whole 24 hours. So after the fifth, sixth or seventh day, the blood stops altogether, no discharges, no colors, nothing. Then they know that they uh, uh, are pure. So if your daughter saw her pureness, or saw her purity, and then fasted, and then she saw these spottings or colorful discharges, uh, not colorful in the sense that it's nice, but it's colored, uh, discharges or she saw a spot or two of blood this doesn't affect her uh, purity and she continues Bassam from Saudi Arabia yeah yes Bassam Hello. Yes. Alaikum alaykum alaykum I'm Dr. Shabib from Medina Shabib uh, okay. and I'm a great fan of yours mashallah you are doing a great job Jazakallah khair Jazakallah khair khair I have a question, Sheikh. Yes, sir. Uh, what's going on in uh, Syria, uh, the struggle of the people of Syrians against the government, is it jihad against the Kufar government? Okay. Uh, and my second question is, uh, Shiaism as such is too far away from the straight part of uh, Ahl Sunnah or Jamia. Now, the problem is, they do many things which are uh, it's not at all uh, valid in Islam. Now, why these people are allowed to do Umrah and Hajj? Or why? Okay. Because they do so many things uh, which are unacceptable and ridiculous. I will answer your questions, inshallah. Okay. Thank you. Khair. Harun from Nigeria. Okay, we lost Harun. Okay, uh, Saqib from Saudi Arabia, he's saying that what's the ruling on visiting the Prophet's grave, alayhi salatu was salam? As this may look like grave worshipping. No, it's not grave worshipping at all. Men, men are allowed to go and visit the grave of the Prophet, alayhi salam, as they are allowed to go and visit any graveyard. And this was the sunnah among the companions. Only if they come away from travel. Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with the man with his father. He was... Living in Medina, he'd nev he would never go to the grave. And let us rephrase it. He would never go to the house of Aisha because the Prophet ﷺ was not buried in the masjid in the beginning. 
He was buried in his house, the house of Aisha, and so was Abu Bakr, and so was Umar. Later on, after 90 or 100 years, the expansion of the haram, one of the Umayyad uh, uh, caliphs included the house, and it became into the masjid. So Ibn Umar, may Allah please them, and the rest of the Sahaba would not go and visit the house of Aisha, except if he traveled, and whenever he comes from travel, he would go to the chamber of Aisha, to the uh, uh, house of Aisha, and he would stand and give salutation to uh, uh, the Prophet Assam, to Abu Bakr, and to Amr, may Allah be pleased with him, and never return back to it. So if you come and visit the masjid, of course your travel is to visit the masjid, not to visit the grave. The grave comes as uh, uh, um, something that follows, not an original cause. So if you travel for the masjid and praying in it, and you enter it, it is permissible to say as salam from the entrance of the masjid, from the gates. Not, you don't have to go all the way to the front, to the chamber and give your salam. Because even if you are in Spain, as one of the great grandchildren of the Prophet salam, so a man putting his head near the window and offering salam. And he said, my friend, you and the one in Andalus in Spain are the same. By greeting the Prophet Islam, by offering salutation, Allah Azza wa has appointed an angel and the angel would report whoever gives salam to the Prophet Islam. And he says, uh, Asim al-Hakim gave you salam. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala abdika wa rasulika nabina Muhammad. So whether you're in China, in Spain, in USA, it, it, or next to the chamber, to the grave, it's the same thing. The, you don't have to shout or you don't have to whisper. It's the same thing altogether. Uh, Ishfaq says that if someone makes Harun from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, Allah. I have two questions yes. concerning Ramadan. Yes, sir. Which I would like to ask. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. The first question is uh, the time for breaking of fast. Does a person, want, does a person need to wait? Second question. Azam. The second question is that concerning the intention. Uh, according to some uh, learned people, they say if somebody left off, uh, he's not aware that the moon has recited, that he wake up in the morning, and then uh, early in the morning he was informed that the moon was recited. And then he just said, okay, he has not eaten anything. He then decided to make his intention. Okay. According to some learned people, they say the intention is only accepted for Sunnah. But some, they say even during Ramadan, if you are not aware of the striking of the moon, that you wake up in the morning and you are being informed, provided you are not taking anything. I will answer you. Make the intention okay. and continue with your fasting. I will answer your question. Okay. That's yeah. clear, I will answer your question, inshallah. Uh, shadow? Okay, shadow? If somebody lost his father, and they won't be giving some uh, this thing to him so that the road will go to him, and give some further cut and the road, they want to know how will he is. I can't, I, can't understand, I can't understand your question, uh, Akhil, because you, I'm listening to you and to the TV uh, set. Okay. Okay, I will, I will, I'll text you. I'll call you later. Okay, inshallah. Okay, uh, Shabib uh, from Saudi Arabia, oh, or Ashfaq from uh, Saudi Arabia, he says that if someone makes a Umrah in Ramadan, the, it is like making Hajj with the Prophet It's not like making Umrah with the Prophet If you make Umrah now, it is as if you're making Hajj with the Prophet So if he, he says, if I'm doing it on behalf of my dead father, would my father get the same reward of Hajj with the Prophet The answer is yes. Would I get something? You will not get anything except, inshallah, some reward because the Umrah was uh, entirely devoted to someone who's deceased, so he gets all uh, the Ajr. Uh, Shabib from Saudi Arabia is saying, uh, the fighting in Syria, is it jihad or not? At the beginning, uh, we, we've stated this, but this is 
not the time to point fingers. At the beginning, it was wrong to have these peaceful demonstrations and thinking that you are in Egypt or you are in uh, Lebanon and we, uh, or in, uh, that is Libya. And we've seen what has resulted from these so-called peaceful demonstration and what uh, uh, has occurred from it. And let's not uh, uh, talk about the, the past. But initially speaking, it was wrong. Now, after we've seen the intentions of this corrupt regime and their blasphemy and their kufr and the assistance of Iran and the uh, uh, Shia of Lebanon, they are collaborating against what? Against the liberals? Against the secularists? Against the American powers? They're, they are collaborating against Islam that is Sunni motivated. And they're joining forces while the Sunnis who are, mashallah, the majority of the Islamic world are just laying back and caring about their shurba and their sambusak. They're not doing anything. Yeah, yeah, make, they come in the media say, we have to do, we have this, we have to do that. But they're not doing anything. With a, a scratch of a pen, they can change things. They can flip things by donating billions of dollars like they usually do. But let's not uh, uh, cry and weep on the situation. At the moment, it is jihad. Because you are defending uh, people that are defenseless. You are defending the sunnah in uh, uh, the face of the, uh, a vicious attack of, of the rafidah. And you are protecting innocent lives. So it is jihad. There is no time for uh, blaming one another. It is a time that where we have to unite. We have to all fight this corrupt regime and those who stand behind them by any means of boycott, even diplomatic boycotting. If, 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 if Russia is supporting uh, um, the fights, the, 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 the regime, why are we still communicating and buying stuff from Russia? We have to boycott them. Why they boycott our products? Why they have problems with our petrochemicals and we don't say a word? No, we should do this on the individual level I'm speaking because what's up is up. It's between them and Allah Azza wa I'm talking about us as individuals. We have to boycott those forces that are supporting to kill our brothers from, uh, and sisters from uh, Syria. He's saying that if Shia as are evil as you are, okay, we have Shiran from Turkestan. Shiran? Yeah, sir, from Kurdistan. Yes, what can I do to you, Yaqi? Yes, Salam wa rahmatullah. How are you, sure? I'm fine, Zakal Khair. Listen to me from the mic, from the phone, please, not from uh, your... I have a question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Sure. I have a question. Okay. Uh, but, uh, please, before that, my name is Ron. Uh, I'm sure I'm from Kurdistan. I have a question about uh, those people have in the How to treat uh, uh, people in the in, in Islam. Okay. How to treat those people are in a way when you explain for them. Okay. How to treat with them. Okay, I will answer you. Okay. Uh, mean? Marriage is gone. Okay. Uh, Shabib's second question uh, regarding the Shia. Why do they enter uh, Mecca and Medina. First of all, this is not to me. I, I don't have any control over Mecca and Medina. Secondly, Akhi, this is a very important issue. Not all Shia are kafir. And this is a conception that a lot of the Muslims have. And this is wrong. The majority of Shia are Muslims. Because by default, the Prophet said, Man salla qibla ila qiblatina wa akala dhibihatana falahuma lana wa lahima alayna. So whoever prays to our Qibla and he eats from our uh, uh, slaughtering, uh, then he is a part of us. So by default, any Shia is a Muslim. Now this is important. Any Shia who says he's a Shia, he's a Muslim. Unless or until he provides thoughts and acts that nullifies his Islam. So XYZ comes, listen, I'm a Muslim, mashallah. I follow the Ithna Ashara Madhab. Mm, okay, this is dangerous. I'm part of Imamiyyah, I'm part of Ja'fariyyah. This is extremely dangerous. 
Come sit with me. What, what do you believe? He said, I believe La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. MashaAllah, you're Muslim. I believe Muhammad is uh, Rasulullah. Okay. What about the Quran? He said, Ah, oh, the Quran that we have is okay, but there are verses that are not correct. Then you are a kafir. Go away. I will not talk to you. If he says that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman are all in hell, they're kafir. I said, You are as well as you are a kafir, they are in paradise before you were born. So I will not talk to you. So if he brings anything that nullifies Islam, then he's a kafir. Therefore, I cannot say to anyone that comes to Saudi Arabia for Umrah or for Hajj that, Oh, you're a Shia, you're not allowed in. Because by default, he's a Muslim, unless he is a turbaned sheikh and he says, No, I believe that Prophet. Islam is not the messenger of Allah, it should have been given to Ali. And I say, okay, akhi, instead of yani, wasting my time, this man is not to be allowed. Uh, Harun from Nigeria says, now what is the time to break our fasting? The time to break your fasting is when the sun sets, whether the adhan is cold or not. So if you are at the seashore or in the desert and you see the sun is setting and then it disappears, you break your fast. Whether the adhan, which is the masjid next door, gives the adhan or not, Regardless, because I saw that it is time to break the fasting. And he says that if a man goes to sleep the night of Ramadan, so today is 30th of Shaban or 29th of Shaban, let's assume it's the 29th of Shaban. And he went to bed after Isha, he did not hear the news whether tomorrow is Ramadan or not. No one talked about the sighting. This person's fasting depends on the following. If he did not have any intention to fast tomorrow, thinking that tomorrow is 30, then this fasting of his is uh, a void, it's not valid, he has to make up for that day. If he goes to bed saying that, wallahi, tomorrow might be Ramadan or not, I don't have time to wait until they tell me whether they sighted the moon or not, I'm going to bed, and if it's proven to be Ramadan tomorrow, then I'm fasting. In this case, his fasting is correct. It's like the uh, uh, Hajj of Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. I think it was Ali when he came from Yemen and joined the Prophet Islam for Hajj. And the Prophet told him, which Hajj are you making? Tamattu, Quran or uh, uh, Ifrad? He said, I said, Labbaik Allahumma Hajj, as the Prophet had did. Or as the Prophet had done. So he made it on a condition which is the Prophet's type of Hajj. Likewise, this person's uh, niyyah is valid. Um, Surah from uh, Tur Turkestan or uh, Turkmenistan, he's saying that if we have people of innovation, of bid'ah, how to make them change, how to uh, uh, delegate and negotiate with them. It's very difficult, but the only means of doing this is by returning them back to the Quran and the Sunnah and by common uh, knowledge and common sense. So usually those of innovation, ask them two questions. And they will bring other examples, but tell them, answer me these two questions. Now, the thing that you're innovating, did the Prophet know about it, salam? If they said yes, then ask them, did the Prophet inform us about it? And they would definitely say no, because it's an innovation. So, if they say no, then ask them, did the Prophet, salam, know it, but kept it to himself and not tell us about it? This is treason and betrayal of the message. So are you accusing the Prophet of lying to us? He said, no, 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 this is not what I meant. He said, okay, then this means that you are saying that the Prophet did not know about it. He said, yeah, yeah, probably the Prophet did not know about it. Okay, then do you know more than the Prophet Allah stated in the Quran, Today I have perfected and completed your religion. So if the religion was completed and perfected, are you coming now to tell me that the Prophet ﷺ had missed things and now you are innovating and bringing these things, claiming that, yeah, the Prophet didn't know, but it's good. Again, this is blasphemous. So people of innovation cannot escape these two options, whether the Prophet knew it or the Prophet did not know it and you know more than him. So I hope this would uh, help, inshallah, in solving uh, the mystery that you may face. Uh, we're not going to take any phone calls, but um, Mubashir says, uh, no, we've answered Mubashir. Uh, Fasiha says, can a woman fast if a drop of blood comes after the intercourse and she has a bath but not the usual period? We've answered this. The spotting of a, a, blood, uh, a spot or two does not have any effect on your uh, sawm. 
Um Abdul Rahman says, if a woman fasts half a day, then her period comes. I know she has to make up for that day, but does she still get the reward of these hours of fasting? Yes, inshallah, she will get the reward. And finally, Abdullah says, is it true that the Dajjal is coming in 2022? Akhi, the Prophet did not know, alayhi salatu wasalam, And all the scholars after him did not know. Pointing out that 2022 is the time for the arrival of the Dajjal, he didn't give us his uh, itinerary. He didn't tell us when it is uh, uh, his expected time of arrival. He didn't even give us the port of arrival or which airline he is taking. So all of this is nonsense. No one knows when the Dajjal is going to come. And may Allah Azza wa Jal protect me and you from the fitna and the trial of the Dajjal. Until I meet you next Friday, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test